Good evening, everyone. I'm Jonna Gifford. I'm the Chief of Adult Library Services here at the Boston Public Library. Thank you so much for making your way on this rainy evening. Uh, kind of cold tonight. And you found us in Rab Hall, and we're delighted to see you in person. And uh, also, may I say thank you to the Arlington International Film Festival for seeking us out as a partner. We're delighted to support your event. And um, uh, what better way to do this than to have a, a, a wonderful author uh, and journalist with us this, this evening? I'm going to let um, April, who's with us tonight, she's the executive director of the Arlington International Film Festival, April Rank. She's going to introduce our guests, but let me introduce April. April is the executive director of the Arlington International Film Festival that will be presenting its 12th edition this November at the Capitol Theater in Arlington, Massachusetts. More than a film festival, it celebrates the arts and has a mission of fostering appreciation for different cultures by exploring the lives of people around the globe through independent film, with specific focus on programming that promotes social justice, human rights, and environmental climate change issues, which is a common platform for uh, us here at the Boston Public Library this year in particular. We have a programmatic theme this year of environmental justice. So we're super pleased to partner with you uh, and to present this evening's conversation. Just a little housekeeping, if you're looking for a restroom, there, is, uh, there are restrooms right at the back of this floor. Uh, we will have a book signing. Our friends from Trident Booksellers on Newbury Street have come over and there's a table. Uh, so Professor Walker will be able to sign your books later. And uh, if you need any assistance, I'll be here. There's a question and answer period after the interview. So um, April and I will be walking around with mics uh, to take your questions. All right. No further ado, let me introduce April Rank. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. So welcome uh, to this evening's program. And as Jana said, we are an international film festival, uh, but we have a history of celebrating the arts in its various forms. And this evening uh, being a celebration of creative writing that has the ability to transport us out of ourselves and allow us to see and understand others. Our thanks to the Boston Public Library for seeing the value in this event and their willingness to partner with special thanks to Kristen Mott, the program's librarian, and Andrew Maxey, the adult program's support administrator. Our sponsors for this program are the Massachusetts Cultural Council, CINE Real Estate, and Social Equity Access Fund. The moderator for this evening's conversation is Crystal Haynes, an Arlington resident and an Emmy award-winning journalist and the weekend anchor for Boston 25 News. Crystal holds a BS in broadcast journalism from Emerson Northeastern's University's College of Arts, Media, and Design, where she is a part-time lecturer. Our guest speaker, Gerald Walker, is originally from Chicago, now a resident of Massachusetts. And as a professor of creative writing at Emerson College, I hope it's okay to call you a Bostonian. So Professor Walker is a graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop and is published in magazines such as Creative Nonfiction, The Missouri Review, The Harvard Review, Mother Jones, The Iowa Review, and The Oxford American. And he has been widely anthologized, including five times in the best American essays. Walker is the author of Street Shadows, a memoir of race, rebellion, and redemption, recipient of the 2011 Penn New England LL Winship Award for nonfiction and named a best memoir of the year by Kirkus Reviews. The World in Flames, a black boyhood in a white supremacist doomsday cult, and his latest book, How to Make a Slave in Other Essays. It was a finalist for the 2020 National Book Award in nonfiction and winner of the 2020 Massachusetts Book Award in nonfiction. He has received fellowships from Guggenheim Foundation, 
the National Endowment for the Arts, and the James A. Michener Foundation. Walker's doctorate is in interdisciplinary studies, combining the fields of American liter African American literature, African American history, and creative writing. And please now join me in welcoming to the stage Crystal Haynes and Professor Gerald Walker. If I'd worn my heels, I would have taken the stairs. Oh, there you go. Hi, everybody. Good evening. All right. Um, so, Dr. Walker. Gerald. Gerald, okay. <laughs> the, I'm so excited to have this conversation with you about this book because the topics, the your experiences, I know this is your third book, but it was very exciting for me to read as well. So, first I want to talk about this title. Yeah. What made you, I mean, it's very provocative, right? So what, how'd you come up with it and why, why this title? Um, the title refers to a famous line from Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. who after he was in a fight with his slave master or before he had a fight with him, when he was tired of his master beating him, um, he said to him, you have seen how a man was made a slave, you shall see how a slave was made a man. And that was the moment when he decided that he would no longer allow someone to treat him as if he were a subhuman. Mm -hmm. um, I use that title because it is in some way a metaphor for the themes I address in the book, mainly how at some point I had to decide that I could no longer be a slave to race in a way that was uh, harmful to me, which is to say to constantly see race and everything that transpired to be so uh, concerned about racism and oppression that it created a sense of paranoia in me. And so while Frederick Douglass reached a point where he threw off um, the treatment of his master, I had to throw off the cloak of racism as being a prevailing theme in my life. Hmm. So this is your third book. Yes. Why did you particularly choose this format of it being a book of essays and also some of the themes? Well, I have always loved essays. My first book, a memoir, was originally a collection of essays. Oh, okay. Um, no one wanted to buy a collection of essays from an author who was unknown. Mm -hmm. And so every time I sent the manuscript out, or my agent did, they would write back and say, we don't want a collection of essays, but if you write a memoir, we'll publish it. And so after many, many rejections and um, desperation started to set in, I decided <laughs> that I would convert all of the essays to chapters mm. and call the book a memoir. So while it's sold as a memoir, it is in fact a collection of essays. Um, after that ordeal, I decided for my second book to go straight to memoir. So I wrote the memoir and for this book, as it turns out, I didn't sit down to write a collection of essays. These books, these essays were written over the course of 16 years. So the oldest essay was published in 2006, the most recent in 2020. So it occurred to me a couple of years ago, I think I might have enough essays to compile and have a book. And so that's what I did. I collected them, gave them to my publisher. She sent them out. They were rejected by everybody. <laughs> over and over again, and finally, after more than 20 rejections, someone took it, and um, it's done quite well. So, I, I, you know, I have a friend who's in publishing, she's like, oh, essays, no one wants to read essays. But this book has really gotten a lot of acclaim, especially given, I think, the climate that we're in now, right? So a lot of these topics are in the zeitgeist, as you, were, as you will, and you're, you're dealing with things like bias in the medical profession. Michael Jackson um, and, and, and other things like that. I mean, did you select, because I imagine you've written a number of essays over that the time period that you've been a writer. Did you select them because you knew it might hit a certain note at this time when they were being published? No. Oh, okay. No, I just, I wrote, <laughs> I wrote what, um, what preoccupied me. Mm. If something uh, happens or I witness something or there's something in the news, that I can't stop thinking about. Mm. Um, I write about it. For instance, my Michael Jackson essay was written 
because of one of my students. This was back, I don't know, um, right after Michael Jackson died, which was right after I joined Facebook. I was not on Facebook, and my students thought that I was um, pretty uncool because of it. <laughs> and so they insisted, these were my undergrads at my prior university, they insisted that I join Facebook, and so I, they, they set up my account. The very first post I saw was from one of those 20-year-old undergrads right after Michael Jackson died, saying, good riddance. Mm -hmm. He's just a freak. Who cares about Michael Jackson anyway? So, which was a knife in my heart, mm -hmm. because I loved Michael Jackson. And it occurred to me that this 20-year-old only knew Michael Jackson when he was a freak. Mm -hmm. And he was a freak. I don't deny that he, <laughs> he became a freak, it's a fact. But he wasn't always a freak, he wasn't born a freak. And I knew Michael Jackson long before his glove and his animals and the kids and all of that stuff. I knew Michael Jackson when he was an icon for the black community. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to write an essay in response to her. And I titled it Before Grief, meaning before the grief that I felt at Michael's passing, but also before the grief of seeing Michael transform himself into something that was unrecognizable to people like me who saw him as an enormously important cultural figure. Mm. What do you think, and I imagine all of these essays resonate to a different part of you, what do you think, which essay in this book really, I guess, sits with you most often? Um, probably the essay Breathe, yeah. which is about my son um, having seizures and being mistreated while we sought to see what um, was causing the seizures. Mm. I remember when I finished writing that essay, I read it to my wife as, I, as is my habit, I'll finish a piece and I'll read it out loud to her. I read that piece to her and when she stopped crying, she said, do not ever read that essay to me again. Mm -hmm. And when I stopped crying, I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it's a really, it's a, it's a, it's a heart-rendering piece. It was, it was difficult to go through it was more difficult in some ways to write about it because when you write about something you really sit with it mm. and when you experience it it happens over a certain period and then it's kind of over with but when you write about something you dwell on it you think about it you revise it and i spent over a year writing that piece so for an incident that lasted seven hours in real time uh, stayed with me for a year as i wrote and wrote and revised it mm. In talking about, uh, I wrote down this quote um, in, in, from the book, and it, it's, anger is often a prelude to a joke, as there is broad understanding that the triumph over this destructive emotion lay in finding its punchline. Talk to us a little bit about the concept of that. Well, when I was um, growing up on the south side of Chicago, uh, my friends and I would often um, experience various hardships in certain ways. Sometimes um, police brutality. I mean, there were times when police would chase us and they would catch us and they would beat us and these, a lot of different bad things happened. Um, and if we allowed those incidents to stay uh, harmful to us in some ways, they would destroy us. And so there was always this impulse for us to try to see how can we make light of this? Is there something in this incident that we can find the humor in? And that's simply no different than what many writers have done. My mentor, in fact, James Allen McPherson, spoke about the importance of finding the comic in the tragic. That life is nothing but a combination of the two. It's not always good, it's not always bad, it's not always sad, it's not always funny. There's a mixture of these things. And if you can find a way to incorporate that in your work, or at least that's my goal, then it allows people to deal with the reality of life, which is sometimes kind of bleak, but also to have um, relief from it by um, expressing some joy or happiness on the other side of the pain. Because I think about this in the context of, you know, all of the racial uprising that happened over the last few years. Um, and I think about the, the, the motivation toward activism during these acts of racism that we see you know, on this very public space, but I, th I read that quote thinking, 
not everyone has access to activism in their life. Not everyone has access to be able to, uh, you know, be protesting in the streets, opposed to, but they need to deal and reckon with the oppression that they feel. And I thought about that when, um, when reading that quote in much of your book in that, because not everyone's going to be out on the street, not everyone's going to run for office. So a lot of regular folks just have to deal with what's happening in their lives. You have to deal with it, but you also have to get a break from it. Mm. And that's kind of what I try to offer people in my work. Um, I, I, in the climate we're in now, the last thing I want to do is to read something that um, echoes some of the difficulties that we're experiencing and only echoes them, but doesn't offer anything positive or hopeful to go along with it. Mm. So I want to give both. I don't want to be all jokes and humor. I'm not David Sedaris. <laughs> But I also don't want to be um, Ta-Nehisi Coates, mm. um, who um, works very hard to make sure we recognize that the world is a bleak, bleak place. It's a combination of the two. Do you think that balance is important, especially in this space? I think it is. Yeah. I think it is. But not everybody does. I mm. mean, some people want to weep and cry all the time. Mm. They should not read my work. Mm. Mm. Speaking of reading your work, I know we had, uh, we're, we'd ask you to read a passage, and I wonder sure. if you would do that for us. I'll read a couple of paragraphs, um, the essay Dragon Slayers, which is about my professor, uh, James Allen McPherson, who uh, was my mentor at Iowa and is largely responsible for um, everything that I've done regarding writing that's been successful. Dragon Slayers. I was at a Christmas party with a man who wanted me to hate him. I should hate all whites, he felt, for what they have done to me. I thought hard about what whites have done to me. I was 40, old enough to have accumulated a few unpleasant racial encounters, but nothing of any lasting significance came to mind. The man was astonished at this response. How about slavery, he asked. I explained as politely as I could that I had not been a slave. But you feel its effects, he snapped. Racism, discrimination, and prejudice will always be a problem for you in this country. White people, he insisted, are your oppressors. I glanced around the room just as one of my oppressors happened by. She was holding a tray of canapes. She offered me one. I asked the man if, as a form of reparations, I should take two. <laughs> it was midway through my third year in academia. I had survived mountains of papers, apathetic students, cantankerous colleagues, boring meetings, sleep deprivation, and two stalkers. And now I was up against a man who had been mysteriously transported from 1962. He even looked the part with lavish sideburns and solid black-rimmed glasses. He wasn't an academic, but rather the spouse of one. In fact, he had no job at all, a dual act of defiance, he felt against the patriarchal and capitalistic society. He was a fun person to talk with, especially if, like me, you enjoyed driving white liberals up the wall. And the surest way to do that, if you were black, was to deny them the chance to pity you. Mm -hmm. Do you find when you're in literary spaces with someone like ta Coates or, or others that you find yourself in, in, in a defensive position at all, or you just sort of disengage from that? I don't spend any time on that at all. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I respect him and his work. Um, I simply have a different point of view, although I held his point of view for many, many years when I first started writing, mm -hmm. that I felt that it was my responsibility to um, blame and to express anger and to express rage, and in some ways to present a kind of uh, hopeless forecast for what the country is and can be. And um, James McPherson, and I don't apologize for mentioning him so much because he's that important to me, but James McPherson made me realize that that outlook is simply not true to any of us, that nothing is all bad, nothing is all bleak, nothing is all despairing. And I had to reshape my thinking before I could have my work have the complexity that I hope it achieved uh, by trying to strike more of a balance. But I do recognize the impulse for some writers to 
attempt to change society uh, by uh, pointing out the ways in which we're flawed and um, the things that we've done wrong. There's certainly a place for that, um, but I take a different approach. Do you find your work is received differently, say, pre-George Floyd versus after George Floyd, or pre-Ferguson versus after? Um, I, uh, one of the things, the National Book Award um, Committee, one of the things that they said about my work is that it provided a welcomed relief from all of what we were going through. Mm. That because it gave us an occasion to smile and laugh when I was reading, I heard some of you chuckle, I appreciate that. Uh, but I, I provided some chuckles, mm. and I provided people the opportunity to say, let's take a break from all of the stuff that's upsetting us, see if we can smile and enjoy uh, life a little bit, and then we'll get back to the nitty gritty business of trying to correct the injustices in this country. Mm. Talk to me about your writing process a little bit. Well, it's a job for me, yeah. and I, when I hear people uh, talk about writing and creating art, as if it's um, a mysterious process where you sort of walk around in you know, your robes and wait for the muse to strike. <laughs> um, that's not the way it is. I mean, it, it, to me, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a job. And I treat it like that. And I learned that when I was in the writer's workshop with one of my professors, Frank Conroy, who talked about the importance of doing the work every day as if you're punching a clock. And he spoke of people who he knew who in the morning would get up and put on their suit and walk into the other room and sit at the computer and, and write. And when they finished writing, they would go and they would take off their suit. And so I learned to um, write every day um, without fail. And so if you are looking for me at any point, if you want to find me at 6 a.m., you can look in my office, I'll be at my computer. Uh, I'm there from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. without fail, seven days a week. It doesn't matter if it's someone's birthday or a holiday or whatever's happening. When I travel, I bring my computer. And my family knows it took a long time to train them, <laughs> uh, especially my wife, who didn't mm. see this pursuit as being something that you couldn't simply pause whenever she wanted you to. <laughs> um, but it, so it's my job. and so I. I, I, I have my block of time and, and everybody recognizes that I have to go to work and I get the work done. Was it difficult to train yourself in that way or the discipline that it takes? Um, it was difficult at first um, until my competitive genes kicked in. Mm. And I want to um, be the best writer to have ever written. And you can't do that if you don't put the hours in. And one of the things that I learned when I was at Iowa um, was that this is a competition. That not everybody is going to get the editor's attention. And I know that editors have stacks and stacks and stacks of magazines to read. They have stacks of manuscripts to read. They have all of that. Why yours over someone else's? There's no reason unless you have done the work and you've put in the time and you've spent every effort you possibly can to perfect your craft so that when they have to make that difficult decision to choose three manuscripts out of a stack of 300, yours is in that three. Mm. And that's, that's my goal. I want to I wanna always be in that three. And I felt that when I was in my graduate program, and I haven't stopped. And I, and I suppose, in some ways, I'm confessing um, that I need therapy. <laughs> because uh, I am still competitive in that way when the, the National Book Awards just announced their finalists today, and I check that list to see who's there. When the Best American Essays Anthology comes out every year, I check to see if my classmates are there. And um, I'm always checking to see where the competition is and where am I in relation to them. And maybe that speaks less of what people imagine being an artist is mm -hmm. than it should. Um, but I don't think you will find many people in the arts who have achieved a certain level of distinction who are not obsessed with doing the best that they can and being better than everybody else at that pursuit. And as you see yourself, you know, writing for many years to come, you know, in different places, hopefully you stay in Boston, but of course, you know, you're, I'm sure your work will take you many places. Do you see your writing changing or evolving into anything else? Um, 
Yes. My next collection of essays is a little less about me, hmm. um, which is difficult for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'm, so I'm writing a collection of essays that are uh, addressing more current events. I'm still prominent in the pieces. Uh, I address them all on a personal level, uh, but I am writing about more current events. I just finished a piece recently about uh, Dave Chappelle and the controversy surrounding um, his uh, Netflix series. And um, I'm writing more about Trump. I'm writing about January 6th. I'm writing about uh, these events. Um, so that's a departure from what I've done in the past. When you watch the news, and this is probably a selfish question on my part, but when you watch the news, I guess, what do you take from that that then you take into your, your writing space? Um, it, it depends. I mean, if, yeah. something, if I see something on the news that I think is um, interesting, yeah. Uh, that I can work with, that I will incorporate it. Um, I'll give an example. Uh, there's a television commercial about that has, um, I forgot what it's for, but uh, Haley Berry is in it and she's dressed as Cleopatra. Uh, my wife knows, so it's okay that I say this, that I'm obsessed with Haley Berry. <laughs> and so um, one of the pieces I wrote recently um, begins with me watching that commercial and asking my son, do you know who that is? And he said, I don't know who that is. And I said, that's Haley Berry. And um, I recreated that event into the start of an essay which goes into uh, my life in Chicago. It, it would have been different had I been born and raised where she is. Mm. And that would have taken me somewhere else. So the whole essay is based simply on that commercial that I saw on TV. Interesting. I won't ask you to critique our writing in the in television news because I know it's terrible. So. <laughs> well, I would love to open it up to uh, the folks in the audience if you have questions um, for Gerald. Yes. We're going to run the mic to you. One second, please. When you write from 6 to 10 every morning, when you write from 6 to 8 and uh, 6 to 10 every morning, do you write in your handwriting or you are using a specific writing formatting program? No, I just use it, my computer. Yeah, but how do you revise and how many revisions? And why did you look? Why did you have to wait for 20 submissions and refusal instead of self-publishing and then? Um, Success. It, well, I'll be frank. Nobody wants to read a self-published book necessarily. Some people do, but there is a certain level of credibility that comes with having a publisher out of New York. And so that's the starting point, and that's where my agent went. You start there and you work your way down. And for many of us, there is a level below which we won't go. And, um, and I hope I'm not being offensive to you, but self-publishing is that level for me. I won't, I'm not going to self-publish my work. I think that there, I can find publishers for it. It sometimes uh, takes a while. Any other questions? Um, I was interested when you were talking about um, kind of like the impact your writing has in the cultural context right now and the responsibility that you take, um, you know, not, not preaching about how to fix racism, but maybe giving some levity. And I was mostly wondering if you are considering that when you're writing or if you're simply writing or if you even see that as your responsibility as a writer to speak to a cultural moment or as your responsibility to write. I see my responsibility is to tell a good story. Uh, I don't have um, a responsibility, in my view, to weigh in on social issues. Um, I write about race because race interests me, uh, not because I feel I'm obligated to or I feel I have a responsibility to. When race stops interesting me, I will write about something else. But right now I find it fascinating. And I think it's the perfect vehicle because we're all obsessed by it and we can't seem to get beyond it. It's the perfect vehicle to use to discuss any number of things. 
So I can use race as a tool to talk about matters that go beyond race, but I don't write about race as, a, as a, uh, an end of itself. It's a means to an end. And the end that I'm trying to seek or trying to reach is to talk about what we are all going through in some ways as human beings. The piece I mentioned about my son who was suffering from seizures and experienced uh, racism in the medical profession is in fact about racism in the medical profession on the surface. Below that, it's about the pain of feeling helpless when someone you love is suffering. We've all experienced that. You may not have had a doctor say something racist to you or a nurse do something racist to you, but you have all felt what it means to not be able to provide help for someone who needs it. And in that way, my story is a story about all of us and not just about the experience that my wife and I have with our son. Boy, I'm really saying some good stuff. We should have a pack. I know, I'll right? I'm like... I'm wasting all this wisdom. I'm not wasting it. I'm glad you're here. But 300 more people yeah. would be good. That's okay. I've said it before. I'll say it again. <laughs> Me again. I was... I, I'm a former student of yours, <laughs> so I know you a little more than maybe other people here, but something I've admired in your writing and your teaching is an emotional balance, um, which you spoke to a little bit earlier of, you know, nothing is fully happy or fully sad. And I was wondering how, how that plays into your writing process. Are you just like that as a person <laughs> or do you come into an essay extremely angry, expecting it to be angry the whole way through? Um, and how, basically, how do you get to that balance? And are you, are you looking for it, or does it just happen? Well, I mean, um, it's a combination of things, and that's a really great question. Uh, when I wrote my first um, book, there's a lot less humor in it than in the last book, because I resisted it. I am, by nature, kind of a silly, hopefully funny person. That's who I am. But when I first started writing, um, I felt, I did feel a responsibility to address racial issues, and I did feel it was my responsibility to condemn certain behavior. It's difficult to do that when you have an impulse to make light of something. And so I really had to smother that part of me in order to write those essays. Those essays were fine. It wasn't until I decided to allow my full personality on the page to allow the humor to work its way into my work that I think my work improved. And so I don't go into my pieces thinking, oh, I'm going to write some funny stuff today. I simply try to tell a story. And as my personality alerts me to the humor in the situation, I respond to it. I incorporate it, but I don't force it and I don't look for it. I simply do what my instinct as a writer and as my personality dictates on the page. I know a lot of writers read a lot. Who do you like to read? Um, I like to read uh, I like to read fiction and short stories more than essays, to be perfectly honest. Hmm. Uh, but I do, I do, I, there are a lot of essayists who I admire a great deal. Uh, one of my favorite right now uh, is a writer named um, Hanif Abdurraqib, who um, wrote an essay collection called um, uh, A Little Devil in America, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, I've been reading uh, Zadie Smith, mm. just started reading her latest essay collection called Intimations, which is, she's absolutely brilliant. Mm. Um, Roxane Gay is one of my favorite writers. Uh, there's just some fantastic, fantastic essays right now. And uh, Imani Perry, who's a brilliant writer, wrote, she wrote a memoir called Breathe um, a couple of years ago, who just today was named a finalist for the National Book Award in uh, nonfiction. Although she is my competition, <laughs> I, I am rooting for her because she's absolutely brilliant. Mm. 
Any other questions? Are you guys saving it for the book signing? <laughs> I have a comment, yes. um, and it's uh, a riff off of the personality piece of, uh, but what really impressed me about your writing was your, your, your humorous personality takes on events, I, and it made it so much more palatable, and I was able to kind of see into um, into a situation uh, that I otherwise would not have been able to because of, of you making it a little bit lighter, a little bit. I was able to penetrate into the situation a little more fully. So I really appreciated that. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Walker, could, could I ask you, it's a weird question, but um, do you feel that this particular moment that we're in uh, culturally is um, uh, different th than, um, than, let's say, you, you know, in your life growing up, and you've you've been reading, and you you've gone to school, and you you voted in elections, and is there something uh, particular uh, about right now that? Uh, moves you as a writer? Um, I have to say, and I'm, I'm not really an optimistic person, but I felt a tremendous sense of optimism when Barack Obama was elected, as many people did. I'm not unique in that way. Uh, but I really thought that this country was headed to a place um, that was unimaginable to my parents and to my grandparents that we were finally going to address some social issues in a way that would be sustainable and uh, positive. But lately, I'm kind of terrified. And I just think that we have regressed so much in so many ways that um, I would not be surprised at all if another civil war is in the making. I simply can almost sense it coming. Uh, that worries me, and I, I will write about it. I'll find a way to write about it, and that's probably why I'm writing more about Trump than I would have in the past, because I do want to help sound the alarm. Something bad is happening, and it needs to be addressed, and we need to talk about it, and we need to, um, the artists in some ways are responsible to capturing this moment in whatever medium they work in to draw attention to it. And even if we do it with uh, some levity at some points, but I do think people need to pay attention to what's going on because it's frightening. Uh, so were you talking about? Uh, sorry. Uh, so you're talking about uh, putting your personality before like your obligations when you're writing your book, or what you felt were your obligations. Uh, I guess can you describe more about that? Like, uh, I don't know, like, uh, uh, sorry. Um, like, uh, did, did you ever get, like, a sense of insecurity when you sort of, like, uh, when you push or, like, uh, put forth, like, a personality? Yeah, I, I guess. That's a really great question, and it, and it it explains why I began as a fiction writer instead of a nonfiction writer, because of those insecurities. I didn't want to put myself on the page for all to see. And so I wrote fiction so that I could disguise my life, my choices, my mistakes, um, all the things that I did that I didn't really want revealed. And so insecurity is a huge part of of any artist's um, work day. Uh, but at some point, you have to get beyond that. And at some point, you have to recognize that we all have insecurities. We've all made mistakes. We've all done things we're ashamed of. And in being honest about that is the way you can redeem yourself. One of the things that my wife explained to me when I was writing fiction constantly, and she knew that the stories were really stories about my life. I simply changed the city, I changed the name, but they were. 
true stories. And she said, why are you hiding? You have absolutely nothing to hide from. Look at who you are. Look at who you've become. Your story is not a story of shame. Your story is a story of triumph. And I think it took me many, many years to recognize that about my work and about myself. And um, the more I focus on that, the less the insecurities uh, work their way into what I do. So when you sit down every day in your office to write, um, are you always able to write every day? And are you, um, do you sometimes uh, start fresh with a new idea every day or until something is, you know, an idea is really taking, you know, uh, mass and moving forward? I, um, I don't have writer's block, if that's what you're asking, but I do write poorly and that will have to be deleted. And so I, I can get it on the page, but I can recognize during revisions that a lot of what I've done is no good and would have to be deleted. So I, I produce, but there are times when I will um, concentrate. I'll stare at my computer and I'll think about the sentence I'm trying to write for several hours. I, when I write for four hours a day, it doesn't mean that I write um, and it results in a certain quantity. I can write for four hours a day and produce one sentence. But if it's a good sentence, that was a damn good four hours. Mm. And that's what I'm striving for. I'm trying to do my best in that amount of time. Now, there also becomes a point, I've discovered, when you can get too comfortable in seeking that one sentence in four hours. And if you do that, you'll write one book when you're 90 years old and that's mm. all you have. Right. So when I find that I've gotten into too much of a routine of going for the one brilliant sentence, I will give myself a word count minimum per day. Sometimes it's 300 words, sometimes it's 500 words. That I will, I will have to get those words on the page, even if I know they're not great but I will have to reach that quota before I leave my computer. But I don't stay beyond the four hours either, so I know when I'm there for three and a half hours, I've only have, I only have 100 words, that I've got, to, I've got to get moving, and I'll write them. The next day I'll come back, and I might delete them all, but I might not, because there might be something worth salvaging in that, what I produced. And that's the importance of forcing yourself to get the words on the page. And that's also why it takes me months and months and months to write an essay. Many of these pieces are very, very short. I write short pieces. They take a lot of time. And I will spend um, sometimes years on a single essay. And I will often stop writing a piece when I feel like I just don't know how to solve it. And I see essays as puzzles. There's no such thing as a failed essay. There's simply an essay that you have not yet solved. You have not yet figured out its solution. And sometimes I have to take a break from it. That happened with my essay, Breathe, about my, my son. I put it away for six months and I worked on something else. And I went back to it, it was cold, I revised it, got as far as I could get. I found a few more pieces to the puzzle but not all of them, and I put it away, and I worked on something else. And in that way, I'm constantly working on pieces. If you looked at my computer right now, you would see probably 15 incomplete or unsolved puzzles. They're all there, and I'm working on a new one now. When this one's done, I'll go back, I'll try something else and see if I have figured it out yet, and if not, I'll move on to the next thing. But I'm constantly, constantly going back to pieces that I've not yet solved because I'm determined to solve them at some point. Hmm. Any last question? Oh, sorry. I'm, yes, I'm, I'm really curious. Um, before you took your first writing class, did you feel that you had a talent for writing or, a, a, or you, did you really want to write and learn how to, want to learn how to write better or how did you come into that? writers 
position that you're in now? Um, I came to it by accident, mainly because I was bad at everything else that I tried. And when I um, started my community college, I went to a community college, uh, I took um, courses in math and I failed them. I took courses in science and I failed those. I took courses in um, politics and I failed that. And I didn't fail, I failed them because I just didn't, I lost interest in them and I didn't care, it's just another F, what does it matter? <laughs> Um, and then I took a creative writing course quite randomly, as I had taken any other courses. And my creative writing professor, after I wrote my first short story, told me, you have talent, and you need to be at the Iowa Writers' Workshop. And it wasn't that I heard him tell me that I was a writer. I had heard him tell me that I was good at something. Mm -hmm. If he had told me that I was good at making shoes, I'd be up here right now with a handful of shoes trying to sell them to you. But he told me I was good at something. And so I wanted to stick with it because I had not found anything else to be good at. Mm. And that was enough for me. And when he told me that he would spend his off time working with me, he, I accepted it. And I worked with him. He worked with me for a full year. Uh, before he uh, rented a car because he couldn't afford one and he drove me to Iowa City so I could see the campus and um, as we were driving back to Chicago and I mentioned that I would like to go to Iowa but I couldn't afford it he offered to pay my tuition mm. uh, and he did so that's how I came to be a writer because there was someone who believed that I was good at something and I wanted to prove him right Professor, when you write a book, do you think who's going to read your book, price-wise? Um, no, I don't, I don't have an audience in mind. Uh, I have prizes in mind. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to win a Pulitzer Prize. I want to win a National Book Award. I want to win a MacArthur Prize, and I want to win a Nobel Prize. So if I have an audience, uh, that's what it is. I'm simply trying to do my best to make my mark. And you make your mark by getting the attention of people who pass out the goodies. <laughs> Thank you. All right, everyone. Well, I, I keep wanting to say Dr. Walker. Gerald, thank Gerald. you so much for your time. Um, and you'll be uh, signing some books uh, outside of the auditorium here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you both. Thank you very much. And if you want to purchase a book, uh, Professor Walker will be signing the books as well. Thank you again for coming. Thank you.